Well, we've come to our final session for our tour through the Reformation. We uh, started way back with why the Reformation matters, and then we started just walking through the solas. And we dealt first with Sola Scriptura and Martin Luther, and then we moved on to Sola Gratia and Ulrich Zwingli, and then Sola Fide, and that remarkable story of Lady Jane Grey, and the doctrine of justification by faith for the Reformers. And then last time, a brief look at Solus Christus and a look into the life of John Calvin. Well, there's a final sola of the Reformation, our last sola to deal with. And this too, we change slightly to soli Deo Gloria and glorifying God in everything. We're gonna see this not so much in the life of a Reformer, but in a Reformation text. One of the texts or types of texts that the Reformers gave to the church were catechisms. These were wonderful, wonderful instruments for teaching Christian doctrine. We see these catechisms. Luther wrote one back in 1527. Remember Luther said, if we don't teach this next generation, all of our efforts are going to be for naught, right? We put all this energy into it, and if we don't teach the next generation, it's going to be wiped out. And so Luther charged his lieutenants to write a catechism to teach children the basics of faith. And he didn't like what they gave him. Some were too moralistic or some were just too heavy. And Luther, I guess, finally realized if he's going to do this, he'd have to do it himself. So he wrote the children's catechism. And Luther's catechism looks at those wonderful, essential texts of Christianity. It looks at the Apostles' Creed, where we learn basic Christian doctrine, looks at the Lord's Prayer, where we learn the basics of the Christian life and of prayer, and then also looked at the Ten Commandments and the Great Love Commandment, where we look at ethics and the impact that doctrine has in the lives that we should live. So that was Luther's catechism. There was another wonderful catechism that comes to us from Heidelberg, and the Heidelberg Catechism. And it's slightly different from Luther's. It's organized around three questions. In fact, the first question, or three sets of questions, the first question I think is one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of all of theological literature. We affectionately call it Heidelberg I. And the question is, what is your only comfort in life and death? And it's a very long answer, but in short, it's the gospel. But here's the answer that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood. He has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation." Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him." So that's Heidelberg 1. Now those kids in Heidelberg must have been pretty smart, because that's a pretty long answer for them to memorize and give back, but uh, nevertheless, that's what it is. Now as we move into the 1640s, we get another gift to the church, another catechism. And this one comes to us from the Puritans. And this, of course, is the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism is a pretty long catechism, especially if you're a kid trying to memorize this. But its first question and answer is far shorter than the Heidelberg, but just as brilliant and just as beautiful. The first question of Westminster asks, what is the chief end of man? Now, you've got to pay attention to every word in there especially the word chief end. So there's a lot of things we could live our life for, and there are a lot of things that we live our life for. But what is the chief end of what we live our life for? See? And the answer is this. The chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And what we have there is a beautiful articulation of this Reformation plank, soli deo gloria, that ultimately we are 
privileged. Stop and think about this. Not only are we redeemed from our sins, not only are we reconciled to God, but you and I are given the privilege of actually glorifying God in our lives. That in everything that we can do, uh, Paul says whether we eat or whether we drink, sometimes we do that three, four, five, six times a day, right? Eating and drinking. That we do all all. That's a, it's a pretty inclusive word, isn't it? To the glory of God. Well, we sort of come full circle. If we, if we start back here in 1517, and back in 1517, and remember, we looked at Luther's life here at 1517 to 1521. And we saw that as the time of debate and the time of dissension from the church. And there we see the sola scriptura principle coming forward front and center at 1517 and 1521, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. Well, here we find ourselves in Westminster at 1647. So we're 130 years later, three whole generations later, we come to the Westminster Shorter Catechism and the Westminster Standards, and we see this Reformation movement started by a monk in his mallet back in 1517, coming into full maturation and spreading down to the cities in Switzerland and then going over to England and seeing the Puritans in the establishment of the Reformation in Britain through John Knox and his time at Geneva and the Reformation in Scotland. Well, how did we get to 1647? And maybe it would help to back up a little bit and just spend some time talking a little bit about the Puritans and where they came from. The Reformation first came to Britain in 1534. And there Henry, with his act of supremacy, broke from the Roman Catholic Church. But what he did, by and large, was sort of remove the Pope and the Roman Catholic papacy and then put himself in the middle. It was not all that deep of a reform. It was not a significant theological overhaul that Reformation in 1534. Now, under Edward and Thomas Cranmer, who was Edward's uh, sort of religious and spiritual advisor during his reign, the Reformation made great strides forward theologically. But Cranmer could only do so much, and when Edward died, well, that put everything on hold. And when Mary came to the throne, it put everything in reversal. Well, after Mary died in 1558, and you don't have to worry about, there will be no quiz. I've threatened you with one, but I won't give you one. But after Mary dies in 1558, her half-sister Elizabeth comes to the throne. Now, one of the things we need to remember is that at that time, Spain was quite a threat. We have not yet had the defeat of the Spanish Armada. And prior to the defeat of the Spanish Armada, Spain is a real threat to England, and Elizabeth can't afford to have all her time chewed up with trying to settle religious disputes. And so she basically takes a position of trying to placate when it comes to the religious question. She's not that hard on the Roman Catholics, and of course she privileges the Anglicans. Well, there are a group of folks who especially were seeing things move quickly under Edward who thought this was a wrong direction to go. And in 1559 and 1560, Elizabeth enacted what she called the conformity laws, which required religious practice to conform to the Church of England. If you wanted to be a pastor, you had to be credentialed in the Anglican Church, you had to conform to the Church. And there were a group who couldn't conform to the Church, and they were called nonconformists, and they were also called separatists. And on the street, in a term of derision, these people were called Puritans, because the idea was they were after a pure church. So the Puritans were essentially legislated into existence in 1560. And through Elizabeth and then on into King James, the Puritans were somewhat kept under the thumb. One of the things King James did was write, and this has got to be one of the, one of the greatest books in history, the Book of Sports. Now, I'll tell you a little of the history behind this. James was from Scotland, and James actually united the kingdom, right? And James would often travel from his castles there in London back to his home in Scotland. And to get there, he went a little bit to the north and up the east. 
and that took him up towards Cambridge and through that area. That area around Cambridge was called East Anglia, and Cambridge was a center of Puritans, especially under Edward, that Puritan thought that was in its uh, nascent stage there under Edward found a home at Cambridge University. And all those pastors trained there at Cambridge were sent out into East Anglia. And James would travel through East Anglia and he noticed something. He noticed that as he traveled through there on Sundays, there were all these kids just sitting around doing nothing. And James would ask his advisors, why aren't they doing something? And his advisors told them, well, they're Puritans and they don't believe in doing physical sports activity on Sundays. Well, James wrote his book of sports that required, this is like, remember President's Badge of Physical Fitness? You had to do that rope climb in junior high, right? So he required that the nation participate in sports. And then he required these Puritans to read this from their pulpit on Sunday to encourage their congregation to participate in sporting events on the Sabbath. Well, under Charles, and it's under James that we can begin to understand why some of these Puritans leave England, go over to Holland, they find that uh, they're not quite sure about those wooden shoes for their kids, they're not sure the effect that'll have, so they decide to go to the New World and settle New England. We can understand why now. There's all this pressure on them. But the pressure got increasingly worse under James' successor, Charles I. And as Charles moved Archbishop William Laud up and up and up the ranks, the pressure on the Puritans got more and more intense. And in the 1640s, largely through Charles' ineptitude, England is plunged into civil war. And coming out of that civil war, Oliver Cromwell, leading the parliamentary forces, defeat the monarchy and establish the time of the Lord Protectorate in the 1650s. But it was during the 1640s, while Parliament controlled London, that they called the Westminster Assembly and brought all of these Puritans to Westminster Assembly to draft the Westminster Standards, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism, the Larger Catechism, and a delightful document called the Directory of Public Worship. And those four texts together constitute the Westminster Standards. There were a number of folks involved in writing this, but the, the theological heavyweights were the Scots, the Scots Presbyterians. And I only say that for Sinclair Ferguson's sake, that we've got to draw attention to the Scots here. But these were the theological, they were few in number, but they certainly brought significant ideas to the table at times of debate and times of discussion in those uh, moments when the assembly met there in Westminster to formulate these doctrines and to formulate these documents that are very much a part of not simply the Presbyterian Church, but very much a part of the Reformed world. Well, out of these Westminster standards, you begin to get a sense of what the Puritans were about. And as you look at them, you see some of the themes that come to the fore. Obviously, they're about Scripture. And so we have a very high view of Scripture coming to us from the Westminster standards. They're also about the other solas, the sola fide and sola gratia. And so we have a wonderful statement on justification in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Again, driving home that idea that it's an alien righteousness and it is immediate. There's no mediator and it's all outside of us. It's Christ working on us. But we see something about the heartbeat of the Puritans in that first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. When the answer they come back with is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now in our day, can't help but thinking about that statement without thinking about John Piper, who wants to change the and to by. So we glorify God by enjoying Him forever. But if we stop at that first part, glorifying God, we see something that's at work here. There's this interesting text in Psalms, uh, Psalm 115.1. And Psalm 115.1 tells us, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, 
but to your name give glory. See? And you have to ask yourself, why does the psalmist have to say it twice? <laughs> right? And we know why the psalmist has to say it twice. Because the pool is not to go in the direction of God. The pool is really to go in the direction of us. Uh, we didn't talk about this with Martin Luther, but one of the words that Luther described, used to describe us is the Latin word incurvitas. Or as I like to say, incurvitis. But incurvitis sounds to me something like the dentist is going to tell you that you have. You know, you can imagine him picking around back in there. So, oh, it looks like you got a bad case of incurvitis uh, there on that molar. What this literally means is to be turned in. The self turned in. And in many ways, that describes us perfectly as human beings in our fallen state. We are consumed with ourself. Our selfish ambitions, our selfish interests, what's in it for me? Right? And so here we hear this catechism. What is the chief end of man? To live for myself. If many people were to be honest, that's what they would say, wouldn't they? To live for myself. And right off the bat, we're told, no. Our chief end is something far, far grander than us. Our chief end is the glory of God. I think that's put first because I think that the Puritans and this group within the British Reformation, I think they were on to something. I think they were able to get right to the heart of the matter of what we are to live for. Now, the beauty of this is that once we begin to understand this, then we begin to see how this touches on every area of our life. Now, to see an example of this, we can go back to that German musician that I was telling you about, Johann Sebastian Bach. It's uh, said that Bach and all of his music pieces would sign his names with two, or sign his music pieces with two sets of initials. He would use his set of initials, JSB, and then he would sign next to it, SDG, Soli Deo Gloria. And he would do that whether he was writing music for the church, and a lot of the music he wrote was commissioned by the church for the events of the church calendar or for liturgies. And so much of his music is church music. And so he saw his church work as for the glory of God. But he also would sign those same sets initials to the so-called secular pieces of music that Bach would write. Pieces that were commissioned by kings or princes or by dukes or pieces that would commission certain national events or moments in the nation's life. And by ascribing those sets of initials to both pieces, Bach was trying to tell us something. He was trying to tell us something that all of life can be lived for the glory of God. There's a wonderful doctrine here that's reflected in all this. Soli Deo Gloria and glorifying God in everything. It's the doctrine that brings much of what the reformers were about right down to where we live. And it's the doctrine of vocation, which literally comes from the Latin word calling, our calling. Prior to Luther's day, vocation only applied to the priests, the monks, the nuns. They had callings. You know what the rest of the people did? Worked. Right. And a sharp divide. And what Luther did was he took that word and he applied it to the professions so that in everything we can bring glory and honor to God. Calvin says in the Institutes, whether you're a pot washer or a preacher, you have your sentinel post from God. Now think about that for a while. Sentinel duty was a privilege. You just didn't put anybody out there, 
In fact, sentinel duty in that day, that was the elite guard that was on the sentinel post. And so when he says, this is your sentinel post, he's saying, this is a very serious calling for what you have been trained and for what you have been put in. And whether you are a pot washer or a preacher, we all have our sentinel post from God. That God not only redeems us, not only gives us this wonderful gift of new life, not only rips down all that scaffolding that we construct to try to earn His favor, gives us His grace and His mercy freely and fully, but He also allows us to live a life that, be, that can be glorifying to Him. This wonderful doctrine of soli deo gloria. Well, we certainly glorify God in our professions. We glorify God in our work. We glorify God in our callings, in our families, as husbands and as, as, as spouses and as, as fathers, as mothers, as children. We glorify God. And we glorify God with the gifts and abilities that He gives us. But we also glorify God, and I think this is one of the lessons perhaps we could sort of end with the Reformers on. We also glorify God when we do what the Reformers did, which was so clearly and so uh, persuasively proclaim Christ in a world that desperately needed to hear Christ. There's a wonderful painting done. And since we started with Martin Luther, I think we ought to finish with Martin Luther. But there's this wonderful painting of Martin Luther done by Lucas Cronach, famous artist in Luther's day. And he had painted Luther a number of times. In fact, there was Lucas Cronach, the elder, and the younger, senior and junior. And both of them painted Luther. But this last final painting for Luther, and Luther, we already looked at his, his uh, final deathbed sermon, right, with Psalm 68, 19 to 20, our God is a God of salvation, and that salvation comes to us through Jesus Christ, who gives us eternal life. John 3.16. But he died in Eisleben. He actually died in the town of his birth. And think about that. He was born there in 1483. He dies there in 1546. And the whole world changed. And think about it. The whole world changed from the time of his birth to the time of his death. And in many ways, he was right at the center of all that change. He was back in his hometown for, to settle a church dispute. And he took ill on the way. And while he was there, he died. And they brought his body back to Wittenberg, and he's buried there in the castle church in the cathedral. And up on the altar, they put one last painting tribute to Luther. And on the one side, there's Luther's audience listening to him preach. And Cronach painted his wife, Katie, in the painting. And Luther, like Calvin, Luther buried a child. He buried his 12-year-old daughter, Magdalena, is the apple of his eye, and she took ill and died. Cronach painted her into the picture. In fact, it's very moving. Everybody else you see in profile, but Magdalena is looking out at you, looking straight out at you. Cronach painted his friends into the painting, Luther's friends. He, he uh, painted Philip Melanchthon, who would be Luther's successor. Cronach even painted himself into the picture. And then on the far end is Luther. And he's up in his pulpit, and he's got an open Bible, and he's preaching, and he's pointing right at you. And it's a great tribute to Luther, right? preaching of the Word. But the key to the painting is the center, because in the center, Cronach paints Christ. So as the audience looks to Luther, they don't see Luther. They see Christ. And as Luther preaches to his faithful congregation, there at Wittenberg, he preaches Christ and Him crucified. And that's ultimately what the Reformation was about, preaching Christ and Him crucified. And that's not just a calling for the Reformers. That's not just a calling for pastors. That's a calling for all of us to be faithful proclaimers of Christ and the gospel of salvation. So we've had our Reformation tour. We've visited some of these great cities. We've talked through the solas. We've met some of these reformers. But at the end of the day, let's not forget this. 
We talk about the Reformers because they so clearly and so forcefully reminded us that we must be talking about Christ and pointing to Him. Soli Deo Gloria.